All right, my name is Aaron Rhodes, and you are listening to the Shuttlecock Podcast. We are sponsored by the Vinyl Underground at 7th Heaven, offering new and used vinyl at 76 and Troost in Kansas City, Missouri. Today on the show, we have Carlos Calderon. How you doing? Good, good. Hello. But, yeah, so if anyone is not familiar, um, you're in a band called Pale Tongue yes. from Lawrence, Kansas, and you just released your debut EP. Yeah, it was our uh, first, I guess, major release. Um, it's our debut EP. Um, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I guess before we get there, I want to get a little background, I think. So uh, I guess I'm just kind of curious, like, what kind of music you grew up listening to and, like, when you really got interested. Um, so the music that I grew up listening to is... I guess a lot different than the music that I write now. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was a kid, I listened to a lot of like uh, <laughs> hip hop, like you know, like Hot 103, um, st- like stuff like that. And then um, I think I was always like drawn to like guitar uh, oriented music, so I started listening to like just like stupid like <laughs> like emo shit back in like you know like middle school and. Um, pretty much all of like my high school like experience I was listening to like um just like all like all this all these indie bands like uh Modest Mouse, The Strokes, um The Killers were like a huge like influence in back in the day. Um and then I guess uh I started playing guitar when I was um a freshman in high school, transitioning like that summer going into becoming a sophomore. And, um, I think the shift happened, uh, when I went to college, uh, I went to the university of Kansas started in like 2013. Um, and I met a really good friend of mine. Um, I think, you know, him, uh, Doug Bybee. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Groomer Peter is also his, uh, project name. Um, and he just like completely like introduced me to like all this new stuff. Um, stuff that I had like heard before, but I think I was kind of like hesitant to approach, um, and I had like a huge seismic shift. Um, and now I really don't listen to a lot of the things that I had listened to before, um, which, but I still like appreciate it. Uh, but um, yeah, like I've almost kind of done like a whole like 180 on like my style and uh, the kind of stuff that I listen to now. So yeah. Mm. No, I'm kind of interested to like, in hearing about like what exact like era of like Hot 103 you were listening <laughs> to and like also and then like the emo that you got into afterwards sure, yeah. like the specific type of stuff. Um, I mean, I was listening to like Chingy, yeah. <laughs> like you know, like um, stuff like that. Just uh, really, just like a bunch of like top forties like uh, hip hop because mm-hmm. um, I don't know. My my parents like weren't into like rock or anything like that. Uh, my my dad's always been like a hip hop head and. Um, my mom's just kind of been like whatever's into like top forty, you know, whatever's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> I was listening to like a lot of that stuff. My first, uh, man, what was my first ringtone? Um, <laughs> like one of those like little like T nine Samsung flip phones. Mm. Um, uh, was it Holiday Inn? <laughs> oh, that's, that's good. If oh that's man, what it was. I feel, that's that's funny. Like that's not even a question anyone would think of like <laughs> asking in 2018. But like for people that like came of age like 10 oh, years yeah. ago, like you gotta know like what their the ringtone was. Oh, for sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, man, like you prided yourself on your ringtone and like your wallpaper because it was like, like it was like Holiday Inn, but then my wallpaper was um, like a, a Green Day. Like wallpaper, like on my phone, like it, like me. <laughs> it made no yeah, sense. you're you're multidimensional. Uh, you, know, you got yeah. <laughs> you got both going on. Um, but I guess that was like, I guess Green Day was kind of my foray into alternative music. Mm. Um, and then I was just hanging out with like the emo kids. Tried skateboarding in middle school. Everyone was listening to Panic, um, MCR, uh, AFI, and stuff like that. And mm. um, I mean, I guess I liked it. Like. Looking back, it's not, like, <laughs> I don't think I liked it as much as I thought I did. Um, but uh, that, like I said, like, um, kind of, like, led me into, 
alternative indie, which was like really getting big at the time, you know, like uh, around like 2009, like bands like Death Cab. Uh, I mean, all those bands like literally blew up. Like I remember Grizzly Bear coming out and they're just like completely changed changed like everything and I mean I'm still like a huge Grizzly Bear fan like I love them so much um but uh yeah that's kind of like <laughs> what I was like into back then <laughs> mm-hmm. and does like your dad being a big hip-hop head does he ever kind of wish that's like more the music you were making is that ever anything you've given a shot um like does he not like does he connect with the your, your rock music at all I think he appreciates that I do it um he isn't really into like the stuff that like I guess, I don't know what's going on like now. Like mm. if I showed him like Lil Uzi Vert, he would be like, what is this dude? <laughs> like he like loves Ghostface and Big Pun um, and kind of just like stuff from like uh, like mid 90s towards the end. Um, I don't necessarily think he would rather me do that. I think he enjoys that like I found like a niche and like I'm like playing guitar and mm. stuff like that. Um, but uh yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and so were you saying that Doug kind of got you into like more kind of like psych rock and yeah, like I think more I had current always stuff? like I, I knew that I had like liked that stuff, but I guess I really didn't know how to like label it, you know. I didn't really know um what I what I liked about like, you know, I like I guess just like psych rock in general. Like I, I had like listened to Pink Floyd in like high school and I was like, Yeah, this is great. I just don't know like what this is. Um and I think uh so like my senior year Coming into college, um, I had started to like, yeah, like, listen to like a lot of like older bands, like, um, like Pink Floyd and Zeppelin, stuff that people grew up like listening to, like since they were kids. And I had like just started to like um, experience those type of things. Um, and then uh, I, I hung out with uh, Doug. Um, we were like the only two people that like had instruments in our rooms, and were really into. Um, it's kind of like older stuff and like slowly he was kind of like feeding me more and more. And, um, man, he, uh, showed me, <laughs> uh, Tame Impala. And I was like, oh man, I'd heard that song before. And I thought it was like a John Lennon ripoff, you know? Um, and so, uh, he actually tried to get me to go see Tame Impala at Starlight. They were there with the national mm. and I was just like, man, I'm just like not feeling it. It's like, like a weeknight in October, like we're in the dorms, I have to study, like I'm just not feeling it. But um, I regret that because they're my favorite band now, like like for sure. Um, and actually afterwards, uh, he was playing um, Lonerism for me. And uh, I was like, dude, like what is this? And he was like, dude, this is the band that I told you to go see. Like this is Tim and Paula. And I was like, oh my God. Mm. Um, and so I think like Tim and Paula completely like like that opened up the like the world neo psychedelia to me and then opened up like i don't know just like all the all this different type of like uh just like garage noise and punk that like i just like i i guess i always wanted to listen to but i never really found out how to you know oh yeah it's it's all like it's even something i've been thinking about a lot lately is just like when you finally kind of find or like learn about the context that like an album or a band came from like it really helps you appreciate and enjoy them more in my opinion like you can show like a 12 year old as many bands as you want but like most likely they're like even if they do kind of like them like they're not going to get like all the I don't know like what really makes them special and all that so it's kind of yeah it's what's what's fun about you know discovering music and learning about it as you kind of grow up. So. Yeah. And I mean, um, Doug and I ended up living together the next year and, uh, like, um, I guess like for lack of a better term, like my musical knowledge, like almost ex- like kind of exploded. Um, cause I was just like consuming all, all this. I mean, Doug has like a huge record collection too. And so it was just like a library that I was able to like pull from like all the time. Like, um, I guess if if you listen to like my music now, uh, like someone I don't know if if it's true or not, but someone might be able to discern that like I'm a, I'm a Jimi Hendrix fan, and I had never like really sat down and listened to any Jimi Hendrix album until um, my freshman year of college, living with Doug, and I had listened to 
um, Are You Experienced, Jimi Hendrix's first album, and that, like, that was one of the moments that completely uh, changed how I thought about, like, music and how I approached um, even playing guitar. Because um, I, I had been playing guitar at that point for maybe, like, five years, um, but I had just been playing acoustic. I was like, man, I'm just, like, going to, like, play, like, Modest Mouse covers and stupid <laughs> shit like that. I, I don't like Modest Mouse by any means now. Like, <laughs> like hey, Isaac Brock. Um, but uh, that's kind of, like, what I was into. Um, and then I was like, holy shit, like, this is, like, nuts. Like, I have to, like, learn how to, like, play music in this manner. Um, so I, like, traded a guitar in, like, one of my acoustics. I bought, like, my Strat that I play today. Um, and uh, I you know, ended up buying my the Vox that I play on today. Um, and, I mean, that's all because I had listened to that album, you mm-hmm. know? It's, like... I was like wanting to know how Tim and Paula was making these sounds, but I was wanting to know how Jimi Hendrix like was playing the way he was playing. Um, and then I was like, the only way I'm going to do that is uh, to just get the equipment and to just like start to do it. And uh, since then, it's like taking me down like this long path of uh, I don't know. I guess like psych rock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Psych rock is a lot of things, and um, I wouldn't necessarily call. Uh, mm-hmm. Pale Tongue Psych Rock. I mean, like, I guess it is. You know, you can't really deny that it is. But um, there's so many different, like, facets of, like, I guess the psychedelic experience and, like, music that, like, are completely different than just, like, playing, like, blues pentatonic scales and stuff like that all the time, you know? Um, Like, uh, there's this band that I started uh, listening to called, uh, I think it's Alton Gün. It's, it's like, this Turkish band, uh, um, and it's it's just like really weird. It's not like, I mean, it's rock, but it's not like, I don't know. Turkish music. Mm. (laughs) It's like nuts. (laughs) But yeah. So. And so uh, eventually you and Doug started playing in a band called real adults, right? Yeah. With a Gary Marsh real adults. We, um, so Doug and I were jamming together like all the time. Doug got a kit uh, we moved out, but we still hung out all the time. He got his own place, and he got, like, a drum kit. Um, I, like, brought over my rig, and we had another buddy. Uh, he uh, came over and played bass with us. We would just jam. We were jamming for, like, a couple months at a time, wrote a couple songs. Um, Doug knew John McCain, and John McCain was in Real Adults at the time with Garrett Marsh and Nick Fredrickson, and they were looking for some new members, and um, they asked us to join because they knew that we were, like, jamming. We had, like, our own little, like, mini mini group or whatever. Um, so then, yeah, uh, Doug and I joined Real Adults. I joined as uh, the guitarist and Doug on keys. Um, and we were with them for about a year. Um, we did a lot of shows locally. We did a couple shows out of town. Um, we did Farmer's Ball. I guess that was, like, the big thing that we did. We we won that year, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and then it kind of uh, just kind of dissipated. I think everybody wanted to do something different, even Garrett himself. Um, and, I mean, Garrett's doing Why God Why now, which is, like, super cool. Such a talented musician. Um, but Pale Tongue kind of came out of um, Nick and I. Uh, at Like, pretty much after every Real Adults practice, we would – stick together downstairs in, like, his basement and just continue to, like, to jam for a little while. We would just kind of keep playing um, because, I don't know, it was just fun to do it. And then um, a couple months later, I booked us a gig, and we had to find a name, so we came up with Pale Tongue. um, And uh, we were a duo in that project for, or in this project, rather, for, um, like, seven months. Mm. Uh, We were just trying to do, like, the whole kind of, like, Kind of like the art flash style, you know? Um, and then, uh, yeah. I mean, how, how did you, know. you and Nick first meet? We, well, we actually met uh, at our first Real Adults practice. Mm. Um, I mean, Doug and I were invited to come down. We had learned some of the songs. Um, I think uh, with anyone, you don't immediately, like, warm up to, like, you know, the pe- like people that you're, like, meeting for the first time. Um, but... Uh, 
I don't know. Real Adults was like a super special group. Like we were we were great friends, and uh, when it was good, it was really good, and we had a lot of fun together. Um, they're all such talented musicians, every single one of them, um, and I, like I'm really fortunate that Nick and I were able to stick together through this process um, and I don't know come up with a lot of stuff uh, anyone that plays with Nick will tell you that like he can just like read your mind and it's totally true like I've I've never had to worry um, about anything really when it comes to how we're, we write our music um, he just instantly gets it he knows exactly like what I want when I'm playing something um, and uh, yeah I don't know he's this is awesome. He's a great partner in crime. And so. so you guys were like a duo for like the first several months, but yeah. um, well, Tanner Spear right. uh, plays on the EP, but you guys have been playing with James from Arc Flash. Now. Right, yes. So how, was was Tanner just supposed to be kind of just temporary, like for the recordings? Or Yeah, so we, at, so at the time, um, Tanner, uh, who plays in, or yeah, he's in Psychic Heat. Yeah. Um, James from Arc Flash and I, we were all living together, um, and Mark from Arc Flash at the time. Um, we were all living together in Lawrence, and uh, I was going to enter Pale Tongue into Farmer's Ball, but I knew we needed a bassist because we just probably couldn't cut it um, as a duo. So Tanner offered to do it temporarily, um, to just come in and play. So we played Farmer's Ball together, and then we thereafter played for um i think several months together him in the project uh playing bass um and then uh we recorded four out of six songs on the ep when tanner was with us um and then the last two songs i I just dubbed everything myself but um tanner left for a little while and then instead we had uh, our friend Joel Stratton. Um, he plays in a project called uh, Tropic of Leo. Um, really, really super smart musician, just like knows his jazz like really well, can pick up like like that. Um, and uh, so yeah, he was playing with us as kind of an interim bassist. Um, and then Tanner came back for a little while, um, left the project. And just recently, yeah, James has been playing with us. Um, and uh, that's been really, really awesome. James is just like, just gets it. And he just like snaps right to it. He's got a great work ethic. Um, and he's just like, I don't know. He's got, he's got great ear. And plus, I mean, now um, Nick is playing Arc Flash. So essentially Arc Flash is the rhythm section of Pale Tongue. And it's awesome because they're just so locked in, you mm-hmm. know. It's like to to have a band like that, uh, to just have a rhythm section that you just completely rely on. Um, super cool because it like lets me have the the breath to be able to do what I need to do. So, no, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. And so you guys are kind of now, yeah, like kind of sister bands with Arc Flash, yeah, and for sure. I guess kind of by extension, Psychic Heat. Except they haven't been super active lately, like. Is is Nick going to be playing in Psychic Heat now? Like, what's do you know what's I, up with them? <laughs> I, <laughs> I haven't talked to um, any of those guys in there. <coughs> Excuse me. So Psychic Heat is currently taking a break right now. Mm. Um, I think some of the members are just trying to focus on some other things outside of the project. Like mm. Tanner's a graphic designer. He's been working um, in the scene as like an artist uh, for a while, and he, I mean, he does like all the repo flyers and stuff like that. Yep. Um, so I think he's just trying to focus on that because I mean that's that's like his career path, you know. Um, and uh, I don't think Nick is going to... I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for him. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if Nick is going to be playing with Psychic Heat or not. But, yeah, I mean, by extension, we're all kind of a trio act, you know? We all just kind of, like, go in and out of each other's bands, um, which is really cool because when I first came to Lawrence, um, it was, like, the Farmer's Ball of 2013, um, I saw Psychic Heat, uh, I found Psychic Heat's EP online, and I was, like, listening to them, I was, like, super into them, um, and then I saw them play Farmer's Ball with, uh, your friend, um, or was it your friend? Uh, I forgot who, who oh, Paper Buffalo was playing that bill, too. Mm. That was nuts, that was, like, the best Farmer's Ball ever, and I was just, I go up to Evan afterwards, um, Evan heard from Psychic Heat, and I'm like, man, you guys just, like, 
you're just like nuts, like just so good. And um, lo and behold, like I ended up like playing with those members like in my own band. And it was like super awesome to have like that influence and to have like their knowledge come into this like burgeoning project that I'm trying to start, you know. By the time that I had started Pale Tongue, I mean, I'd only really been playing locally in the scene for, um, I guess, like a year and a half. Um, and uh, I mean, now it's probably, it's been like three years that I've been playing it, you know. Um, but it's it was it was super cool to be able to play with Tanner and to be able to like share like members in our bands together because um, I like totally looked up to say and I still look up to Psyche Keith. They're just like. They're veterans, dude. They're awesome. I, they're so good at what they do. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess we are kind of just um, rotating, like sister bands, you know. Mm. I know Psyche Heat's not really active right now, and Art Flash is still active. But um, I guess our three bands were like the, the psych rock bands of like the area, you know. Um, and so I guess we're trying to just like at least in Pale Tongue, I guess I'm trying to, like, not carry the torch, per se, but, um, I don't know, keep the spirit alive that, like, Psyche Heat, like, brought to me, you know, mm-hmm. when I first saw them, so. Oh, yeah, like, I, I was kind of going to ask, like, what what do you think, make, like, do you think there's something in specific that makes Lawrence a great town for, like, garage rock and psych rock and stuff, or do you think it is kind of just a coincidence that that sound is, like, pretty successful there yeah we've i've talked a lot about this with some of the other musicians there it's it's definitely like i don't know i I think it's because lawrence is just like it's just weird um i lived in lawrence for about six years now maybe going on seven um it's i mean it's it's true there's definitely like uh i mean between bands like karma vision and oils um all the way to like your friend and like psychic heat uh and art flash i mean like I don't know. It's like a town that like loves their delay pedals. <laughs> like honestly, um, I don't new, know. Yeah, new slogan for the city. Yeah, no, it's so true. <laughs> like we totally do. Art Flash, dude. Like Delay King um, knows how to work delay pedal better than anybody. Uh, I don't know. It's weird. Um, I can't really. I can't really pin it. But I think it's. I think it's like one band kind of just inspires the next band. And the next band. Um, I mean, I. Pale Tongue, early Pale Tongue was like heavily inspired by Art Flash mm-hmm. for sure. Like I, um, I mean, I'm really honored to call James my best friend and my roommate and also my bandmate. Um, but uh, I mean, I looked up to, and I still do, I look up to these guys. Um, and uh, I think I was just trying to imitate the, the things that I really enjoyed. Um, and then it, as with anything, um, it just kind of becomes, you, you make it your own and turn it into, uh, I guess, your own style. Um, and that's what, kind of what I did when I watched, like, Seki Heat and, and Art Flash some years ago. Um, I just took a little piece of that and then tried to, like, in, inject it into the stuff that I was doing, and then it, com- it just became its own thing, you know? Um, and I think that's really, like, the spirit of Lawrence. Bands just kind of, like, playing together, sharing things together, uh, being motivated by each other. Um, I mean, I love the Kansas City Lawrence music scene, um, but I've always really felt at home in Lawrence because uh, I don't know. It's like every, everybody just knows each other, and even if we're like not playing a show together, we're, we're always going to each other's shows and just like, I mean, you can say that about anywhere, of course. You know, it's not like it's a unique thing, but it definitely when you're there in Lawrence and you're playing with these bands, uh, it feels unique. You mm-hmm. know, so. And I guess I was kind of curious about um, some of, like, the lyrical themes on the EP and what sure. kind of inspired your, your writing there. Yeah, so I, uh, I've i always been... Okay, so to explain that, let me explain to you where the name Pale Tongue comes from. Mm. Um, I play this video game series called Dark Souls, <laughs> and... In Dark Souls, uh, there is an item called a Pale Tongue. Essentially, the long and short of it is when you're playing another player online and you kill that player, you rip their tongue out and it's a trophy. And it's, it's like a Pale Tongue. You like offer it to your god as like part of the covenant. I don't know. It's like stupid lore. Um, so that's kind of where I got the idea from because uh, I was like, oh, this sounds like pretty heavy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, 
that game series uh, draws a lot from like Lovecraft and stuff like that. And I'm a really big fan of like Lovecraftian cosmic horror. Like the idea that um, there are these like these this whole like existence and these like entities and these beings that are so ancient and primordial that like you can't even like fathom them into like the idea that just like drive you mad. Like I think it's super cool and I really wish that like um a lot of like modern horror would draw from stuff like that. Um because I think it's like super cool. Um so I guess I try to like bring elements of um because I'm just a big nerd dude, you know, <laughs> I just try to bring elements of like role playing and like dungeon crawling, um, kind of like all the stuff that I love in like a really good video game. Um, and like try to just mix it together with, um, I don't know, like super Lovecraftian, weird, cosmic, uh, just chaotic, uh, goodness, you know? Um, and so the songs, a lot of them, um, are kind of disjointed in the total context of, I guess, what the album is. Um, but they're, it's all like, it's all kind of like subcontextually uh, Lovecraftian in a way, you know, or at least like it's fantastical in some manner. Um, I tried to be like a serious songwriter and actually write songs about like, like, like the way I emote and, and the way I'm feeling. And it just doesn't, doesn't translate because um, I think I took a hard look at myself and realized that I wasn't a songwriter, but I'm a guitarist, you know, and um, I can speak more through like the way I play than the way I can, I like I'm writing or the way, what I have to say. Um, so I kind of just made that work for me. And I was like, well, if I'm not going to be able to like write about anything that's like super like emotive, I might as well just write about like stupid, scary bullshit and just like, make it work um so that's you know where a lot of that comes from um the lead single that we have on the ep is called king and yellow that is entirely inspired by this uh lovecraftian story um from like the late 1800s this guy named robert chambers wrote this weird story about this i don't know this like cosmic creature in some like far off universe or something like that i don't know but i was like yeah dude like I fucking love that story and let's like use it. And I like just wrote a song about it, you know, mm. R slash Lovecraft. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, you're kind of saying that like, you don't see yourself as like a particularly like strong songwriter in the sense that like, you're not like good at like articulating your emotions or that type of thing. But like, I don't know. I feel like once you are like just kind of putting the pen to the paper and like writing all these songs, even though they're not like, super personal maybe but like I think once you kind of like work on that muscle of like just writing songs sure. and like figuring out the I don't know just like the format of it and everything like I, f I feel like you probably will like learn so how too. to like inject like more personal aspects <laughs> of it a little better yeah um we have a song on the EP it's called uh Fever Dreams it's track four mm -hmm. um I guess that one is probably the most personal one because um, it doesn't actually deal with any like um, horror themes or like Lovecraft themes. It's, it's uh, uh, like the lyrics are um, like, I could say it'd be fine that we just be all right. Like stuff like that. And um, when I wrote that song, it, it didn't, have any meaning I guess the chords had meaning the way the song was like the way I was playing it it made me feel a way but um then I tried to take some like personal experience like experiences rather that I've, I've had recently in my life and when I had to put the pen to paper when I had to finish writing the songs I was able to draw from that and kind of like make this um make a more emotive song than what I had written before um and I think I'm getting better at that for mm -hmm. sure I think as I'm I think I'm kind of afraid of doing it, but as I'm forced to do it, um, I find that it's getting a little easier as I go forward. And I think um, this next foray into um, whatever we do next, whatever uh, be a seven inch or album or you know what have you, um, I think I'm going to try to work that muscle out a bit more and uh, try to find, try to dig a little deeper 
and to the way that I'm writing my lyrics and the content of what my songs are. Um, cause, uh, I was kind of afraid of it at first, but I don't know. I think the feedback that I've had from that song, um, and just how I feel about it now, uh, have kind of like pushed me in a, in a direction where, um, I'm a little less afraid of trying to uh, expose myself a little more, you know? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I guess I was also a little curious about, um, the EP's release, like you, it's it's like, uh, like kind of co-released by Manor Records, right, right, and Indigo Sun Records. Yeah, so because um, I, I know Manor Records is like the Mama's Boy guys, right, right. But I, I don't know anything about Indigo Sun. Is that like something you work on or no? So Indigo Sun, um, I actually hadn't I, I hadn't known Indigo Sun. Um, his name is Taylor McHenry. Hmm. Uh, he's he's just a uh, He's a guy out here that's that's running like a small tape label. Um, so uh, even though we went through Manor Records to do the official release, um, I uh, Sean Crowley from Manor Records uh, recommended um, that we go through Taylor um, for like distribution and to like actually duplicate the tapes. Um, he offered us a really sweet deal, uh, and he did like super great work um, on everything from like the Norelco box to just like the, the how like the design that I made transferred to the layout. Um, so they're relatively small right now, I think. Um, but, uh, I mean, they have Mama's Boy and Pale Tongue like on their portfolio right now. So, um, I think we're actually going to do another run of tapes. I'm I'm probably going to go to Taylor again. Uh, but, uh, it's, I don't know. It was a super nice experience for like our first time. We definitely wanted to do something that was like super small and manageable, something that was more of a commodity piece. So we wanted to go with tapes instead of doing like CDs or even attempting to like do like vinyl. I mean, we can't even stretch six songs on the vinyl, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, I think the next release, uh, I mentioned earlier, I didn't know what we were going to do, but I think we're going to do a seven inch. Nice. Um, that's just kind of what I'm thinking. Um, it's just a little easier to at least keep the, keep the ball moving. Um, but not like, dig yourself into a hole super deep with like a whole like 45 minute LP. Like, Mm. man, (laughs) that's going to be rough, but I mean, that's, it's a goal, I guess. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. And you did the album art for the EP also, and you also do something called fuzzy optics. Fuzzy optics. Yeah. Which is like your, like, uh, I don't know. What would, what would you call it? (laughs) Um, so, Fuzzy Optics is, I guess it's like my my name for when I do um, analog visuals. Mm. Um, so I, I produce art that's, um, I guess it's, I guess what you can say is it's glitch art. Essentially, it's what it is. Mm. Um, I got into doing glitch art and doing analog visuals because um, I was looking for a really cool light show for Pale Tongue. Um, and it kind of led me down this weird path of starting to get into this thing called video synthesis, which is just like, um, it's just like pretty much mixing video signals together with like old, uh, you know, TV equipment, like, um, CRT televisions, um, old video mixers, uh, the feedback that that kind of stuff generates when it's like really like when the circuits are bent and it's like glitched out. Um, my roommate, James, he, uh, was actually doing stuff really similar to what I was doing. Um, and he lent me some of his gear, um, to kind of like start like figuring out like what I was doing or even like, you know, um, and from that I was able to produce like a couple of like really small, cool like clips of just like weird video feedback and, and like really glitched out stuff. And that kind of led me down a rabbit hole of getting my own stuff. Um, now I have like, my room is like filled with just like a bunch of like RCA cables and like, stupid like little weird devices um but uh yeah i've been doing that for about a year and some months now um it's really cool i've been able to meet like a lot of other um analog glitch artists on like instagram etc um some of the artists that i know um went out and just did desert days um they're doing like saturnalia festival um austin city limits and like some other stuff Mm -hmm. um and I didn't realize it, but, like, so I guess, like, in the history of, like, psych rock, um, there's always been, like, 
uh, live oil painting kind of stuff like that. Um, but now I think what people are really into are, are like analog, like these glitchy, super weird visuals. Um, and uh, I, you know, I have the equipment to do it and I've just been trying to, um, I don't know, trying to do more and more. I'm trying to do like visuals for people like here um, in the scene. A lot of artists, um, like musicians, don't have uh, visuals for their sets. Yeah, especially seen, like rock bands. Yeah, like it's in super, it's, it's like huge in Austin and in, in like LA. I mean, like they're hiring these artists to do like these huge festivals for like King Gizzard and Tame Impala. Yeah. But um, here in like the Midwest, I guess at least uh, DIY, um, it's not really happening. And uh, I guess I'm just trying to, um, I'm trying to incorporate that in my project, but I'm trying to also give that to other artists as well. Um, I've, I've done shows with uh, Why God Why, um, uh, Lucas Carpenter, he's a local musician around here. Mm. Um, I've done shows for Arc Flash too. I mean, I have a visual set for Pale Tongue as well. Um, but yeah, a lot of it just came out of just messing around with VHS tapes and stuff like that that I had lying around. Mm. Um, for the album art, uh, which was actually my first foray into graphic design, um, I, I mean, I, it was just, I just made an image, just like a video feedback loop, and I just took a picture with my camera. Um, and then in the insert, there's a picture of Nick and I, um, and I just ran that picture through a bunch of uh, analog effects that I had generated um, and then just photoshopped it all up, just cropped it all. Mm. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. yeah, and I think the first time I'd seen you do the uh, live visuals was for the Gorilla Toss show at White Schoolhouse. That's right, yeah. And that was yeah. super fun to see. And yeah, everyone got time. the like the little... Uh, would those be like 3D glasses or are they kind of more like kaleidoscopic type stuff? Diffraction lenses, diffraction mm. glasses. So just like, so that like any, any light you look at just like shoots like a rainbow um, spectrum thing. Um, that was actually totally Paige Batson's idea. <laughs> um, Peachy Productions, mm. uh, which was super awesome. It totally like worked out with our visuals that we had going on. I, I worked with um, uh, the artist that does visuals for Gorilla Toss on the road. Um, and we were just like, yeah, let's just do a collab together. And so we just threw our projections over each other. And yeah, I mean, I, I ended up being like super, super cool. I mean, I, I love Gorilla Toss. Um, I've like wanted to see them for years. And it was like super cool to be able to do visuals for them, especially in like this cool setting with like all these cool people. Everyone's wearing these like weird ass glasses. Um, but I mean, kind of like, the stuff that I was doing that night is essentially how I came up with the, um, the album art. You mm -hmm. know, I just took like a million different pictures and was like, this is the coolest looking one, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I've, I definitely enjoy, um, doing that. And I enjoy that. Like I can also do it with music and do it for other artists. Cause, uh, I really do think, um, that having a really awesome visual experience is like super important. And I see a lot of bands come through town and I play with a lot of bands um, that, uh, man, they just, just so awesome. Just, just viscerally great experiences. But um, I mean, like what, what sets like, uh, you know, like what sets apart like a stadium performance from like, uh, from like the Granada, like, I mean, it's like the lights, you know? I mean, like, lights are super important, and I think just having a really good visual set uh, will really elevate uh, your act to, like, the next level, and I really want to bring that to the Midwest, I guess, or at least just try to bring it to Kansas City and Lawrence, you know? Mm. So I think it's important. Are there any, like, bigger shows you've seen with, like, cool visual elements that have, like, really inspired any of your work or, like, that you just got really excited about at all? Um, yeah, so uh, I watched um, I watched a video of, okay, f first, like, King Gizzard, like, Jason Galea is just, like, man, he's, he's, like, a true wizard, like, in, like, all of his, like, visual stuff. I mean, he's doing everything for them. But um, 
I mean, when I had realized that, like, the so the video he did for Crumbling Castle, when I realized that, like, a lot of the techniques he was using to create those visuals in that video were stuff that I, I had access to, I was like, man, this is nuts. Like, I can totally do this. Um, and then I had watched uh, Tim and Paula's, like, panorama of, like, 2017, and they had this, like, I think that's when they debuted their, like, current light show. It was just insane. All this cool stuff, and I looked into, like, how that light show was made, and that was, like, uh, like three or four different teams of, um, of like, graphic designers, uh, like, digital artists, like, um, media compositors, just all this, like, all these people coming together to make this, like, super cool experience. Um, and so that kind of inspired me to... Uh, to try to hone in on, because I, I was already making the visuals at that point, but trying to hone in on um, on doing it just for for like my project, because I started looking to do it for my project. Um, I then kind of got distracted and was just like, oh, I just want to make cool art in general. But then that kind of like brought me back to like, okay, wait, let me focus and make this about like not just about doing visual art on the side, but like somehow trying to incorporate this into, um, I don't know, into pale tongue, you know, like I was like, I had everything that I needed to do. Um, so that's why I made the, the album art. Um, I did that music video that we just released with you, um, the stone. And that was, uh, all just, just random analog footage that I just glitched and, uh, made it work, you know, and just cut it up later on. No, oh, yeah. So. If anyone hasn't seen that video too, that's on the website, and I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun to watch. And yeah, that was no, fun to make. no, yeah, and no, yeah. Just like the Grill Toss show, though, too. Like just to go back to that, like, e- like during during their set, like you would just see like these little like you you would see like these like deep fried memes pop into the background <laughs> and like these old right. cartoon clips and everything and just like yeah it was just like it made me really wish that there were more like rock shows and DIY shows that yeah. I went to that kind of utilized that stuff cuz like like with like cues <laughs> from like lyrics and stuff mm-hmm. you can only, you can already just dive into a whole different world of like visual elements and then even just kind of going off the mood you can even like i don't know yeah it's not it's it's very it's a very underutilized field in the diy scene i think no i i entirely agree i mean any house show that i that i do that i can bring um my visual rig to i will like most certainly do and i mean like artists are doing it too i mean um face face like he's got this super cool um ryan he's got this like super cool um, video synthesizer box that uh, I was playing with um, on a show that we did together. Um, but it's just, like, triggered by audio. You just plug it right into your PA, and it just, like, it can, like you just twist the knobs, but it's, like, uh, generating these shapes um, to the beat. Mm. I'm like, that's just super cool. Like, that's, that, like, brings it to, like, it elevates it to that next level. Um, and even if it's not, in like, in a performance, I think artists just need to focus on um focus on like their media and focus on like their the like their representation visually um mama's boy uh jared Bajkowski does like a lot of cool um little like videos and gifts for mama's boy just just to like promo a show or like promo tour or something like that but like that kind of stuff definitely sets them apart from a lot of bands that i've seen around here um and even um, Hi Westus uh, just put out that like a short film, like a twenty five minute short film for an album, like that's like visionary, you know. I mean, like, like I, you know, I think I've seen things like that done before, but for that to happen in like this area, like that guy deserves like some super recognition because that's a lot of work, um, and to understand that like, uh, you know, like music can't exist without like some type of imagery. I mean like album art in, in itself, like you have to put a picture to, to what you're hearing um, and to take that to the next level. Um, I definitely respect Sean Teamer for like even producing that because um, that's like an ambitious effort. Um, and uh, 
yeah, I don't know. I really do think that artists really in this area really need to start focusing on like their, their media presence. And, um, that's what I'm trying to do a lot with pale tongue. Cause just cause like, I'm like, Oh dude, I have all this equipment. Why not just like make stuff just constantly for it? Like, you know, why not create an aesthetic for yourself? Yeah, so. And even like with just how accessible that like Photoshop and video editing exactly. stuff is at this point, like it, it's kind of, you know, dumb not to. No, you know. no. For like super serious. I mean, um, so when I went to school, I was, I was a film major for like three years. Um, even before then I was doing like video broadcasting in high school and stuff like that. And, um, I was super lucky to be able to retain the knowledge of like learn, like knowing how to do some audio and like, um, how to like operate these editing suites. But like, I had never even touched like, um, Photoshop until I was forced to, um, when we were designing the album art. Um, but, uh, I mean like, I don't know that I was able to create what I was able to create with, with the knowledge of like, you know, the, the editing suites and like, like the film editing suites and stuff like that. And then I was just like, okay, well I have all this stuff made, um, from editing and stuff like that. Let's just like force myself to, to work with it on Photoshop. Um, there's no reason why anyone, uh, who's able to, uh, that wants to do it, um, that wants to create this aesthetic for their project or whatever, um, can't learn stuff like, Adobe Premiere, Final Cut Pro, even like Windows Movie Maker, you know, just basic, just chop stuff up and just press play. Like, um, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen some bands that like, um, maybe their stuff like wasn't all like super, super great, but like, man, they're doing it. And that's like super awesome to see that like, they at least know that like how important it is to have visual representation. And like, even if your music video is just like, like obviously like my, like, I like the stuff that we've done and I'm proud of it, but like, I know I could do like so much better and I'm going to continue to do so much better, but just trying to do it is like super important and like mad props to bands and artists out there, um, that understand the necessity of media representation visually. Mm. It's super important. Oh yeah. And you mentioned that you were a film major at KU and I guess I also was, I was going to ask like what type of work you were doing while you were there, like what kind of, film and stuff you were focusing on? Yeah, so um, I went into film school at KU um, having this idea of, like, what I thought I was going to do. Um, you know, I wanted to just, like, I wanted to be, like, a cinematographer. I wanted to, like, get behind the camera and, like, create, like, the composition of films and stuff like that. Um, but I ended up taking um, a class my freshman year uh, it was called experimental film. It completely changed how I perceived uh, film, and um, I think I a lot of like what I do now um, is, if not derived, definitely inspired by um, a lot of the stuff that like I had seen like in that class. It totally stuck with me, um, and uh, it completely just like I said changed how I thought about film because everyone thinks film is just like this, it's a narrative piece. Everyone thinks it's like, there's a beginning, middle, end, like the climax and denouement. But like, um, it challenged me to think of film as like an actual art form. I mean, you have uh, like artists that were um, taking actual film. Like there's this, there's this uh, filmmaker's name is Stan Brackage. I'm super influenced by him. He was taking actual film, was painting on the film every single frame was with like different oil paint or like scratching into it or whatever, um, and uh, yeah, and it was that like just ran it through the reel and like that was like film, you know, um, and so that kind of stuff uh, was the stuff that I was trying to do when I was in school, um, but I ended up. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ku film school, you ended up just you kind of end up learning a lot of theory as opposed to more practice, you know? Um, I think I would have liked a program that had uh, more opportunities for um, production uh, within the school itself as opposed to, like, having to join a club like Filmworks or something like that. 
totally not like dissing on KU film. I mean, I met a lot of great people and there are a lot of great people in that department. Um, and it's super valuable to have a, a film school in the middle of like nowhere in the middle of like the Midwest, you know, you'd have to go to like, um, Northwestern or someplace else to help go like find a good film school. But man, they do a damn good job. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I mean, hey, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have been exposed to a lot of the things that have influenced me now. Um, like, uh, like the experimental films that like I had seen, like, you know, I just really like that stuff. And, uh, mm. I don't, I think if I were to go back to film school, I probably wouldn't want to do anything like narrative. I'd probably just want to try to do like the experimentalist route, something like that. So, yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. And so Pale Tongue has, like, you kind of have a, a Midwest tour kind of split in half that you're right. kind of in the middle of right now because you went and played, um, like, a DIY fest in Fayetteville, yeah. Arkansas mm-hmm. last week and a couple shows leading up to that, like, Springfield, Missouri, I think, right? Yeah, or, so yeah. this past weekend uh, we played, um, we did Springfield, Tulsa, and then we did uh, Mid South DIY Fest in Fayetteville, and then we came to Kansas City and played at uh, the Stray Cat Film Center, which is like super awesome, by the way. Like that's like such a cool space. Um, yeah, the the idea of, of splitting it up was literally just so I could like have the weekdays to work, because mm-hmm. <laughs> um, like I don't know, it, it kind of just makes more sense to just like do it on the weekends when you're bound to make more money, anyways. Um, and just get better draws at shows and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, this first leg of the tour was anchored around that mid South, um, DIY fest. We played with the bands from Fayetteville, um, back in the spring for the main record showcase called the Flems. Um, if you haven't heard of them, they're super like, oh, they're like nuts. Um, but yeah, so they asked us back then if we'd be interested. We locked it down over the summer. Um, and then, yeah, we came and played the second night of that show. Um, it was super cool. Uh, Calvin Johnson from K-Rex played. Um, super cool to see, like, just, like, that figure, like, in the same, like, double-wide trailer that is Backspace DIY. Mm. Um, I, was, I was like, wow, like, this is nuts. Um, but that festival was just awesome. I mean, like, Ten High played, The Flams, um, just a lot of cool bands. This cool band from Austin called Crow Magnus. Um, and that was the first time we had played Fayetteville, and we received, like, a really warm welcome. Um, all the people there are super awesome. It's a really vibrant scene. Um, they really, really, like, understand the DIY aesthetic out there. And uh, it's cool that, like, you can just go to a place like that and just be, like, taken in so like lovingly um with your art and uh definitely gonna try to play Fayetteville again soon Mm. um but yeah I mean that was the first leg of the tour this week we're gonna play in Columbia um with our friends from uh Illinois the Golden Fleece uh they're kind of from that whole like day trotter scene with like Condor and Jaybird and stuff like that um and they're just like really awesome. We're gonna do the rest of the tour next week with them too. We're gonna go play um, uh, in Illinois uh, for two dates, then Milwaukee, um, and uh, oh, and then Minneapolis. So it's gonna be a f- super fun time with them. The Golden Fleece are just like such talented musicians, and they like really keep that like psych, uh, kind of like psych pop rock thing like really going strong out there um especially considering day chatter is not really a thing anymore um but they're like totally like that's not stopping any of them and they're just like powering through and like making their own spaces and stuff like that so that'll be really fun oh yeah and did mama's boy and salty both play the fayetteville fest as well or uh, one, um, one of them i i think salty may have played the day before mm. Um, I don't think Mama's Boy played though, okay. but I think we've all kind of been talking about trying to do South by together. So um, I think I don't know. Everyone's trying to do South by. It's kind of tough <laughs> um, figuring out everybody's schedules. But yeah. 
um, at some point, uh, I know Arc Flash and Pale Tongue are going to try to do South by together. Probably going to try to link up with Mama's Boy on one of those dates, um, and then probably like try to link up with the Flems at some point um, in there. I don't know. It's it's like super tricky. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's South by, but um, but yeah, I, I mean, I love Mama's Boy. They're just like just awesome, awesome dudes. And uh, Sean Crowley has just been like such a huge help in this whole EP process. Um, and uh, yeah, going to probably try to play a show with them pretty soon. So. No, yeah. So you have these few more tour dates this month, and mm-hmm. you're thinking about doing South. You're trying to do South by, and you said you want to try to get a seven inch done next. Is yeah. There... So I guess the timeline is is that we're gonna we're gonna finish up this tour, probably play a few shows um, in the area. Maybe not Lawrence all too often. I'm trying to play a little less in town, um, and then. I think after that, we're definitely going to try to do South by and tree fort, um, come March, like springtime, probably try to do like a month long run. Um, and then I think after that, uh, I guess in between now and when we do that, we're going to try to record, um, some new stuff, probably try to put it out in the summer and see if we can, uh, start to do like a West coast run by the end of 2019. We played with this, band called Frankie and the Witch Fingers and they're just like super cool and played with them twice. They're um they're a pretty hot band out in LA right now. And so we're gonna, I don't know, try to try to get in contact with them and uh see if uh see if the West Coast is is feeling it, I guess, you know. It's I mean it it is though. It's it's super nuts out there. I went to Desert Days just a couple of weeks ago and uh man they they're vibing out there. Did my bloody Valentine play that yeah. first? Did you see it? The mm. loudest band I've ever heard. Yeah. Yeah. Like, seriously, like, man, um, you know, I saw Deer Hunter at the Granada and I thought that was like a super loud band. I think it was just mixed poorly. <laughs> but, uh, holy shit, my bloody Valentine was just like so, like, I had to like walk to the campground like 20 minutes away to even discern like what instruments were being played. I knew it was all Kevin Shields guitar. Like I was like, okay, like <laughs> literally anything I'm hearing right now is just a guitar. Even that drum beat dude, like that kick is a guitar, <laughs> but like, man, I mean, it was an awesome experience. Like they're, they're like such a cool band. Um, but boy, was it loud. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, is there anything else that you want to plug or any, you know, stuff like that? Anything you forgot to mention? So far? Um, for Pale Tongue, uh, huh, no, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I think we're kind of just, uh, just kind of coasting right now on this tour. Um, the EP's on Bandcamp. EP's out everywhere. EP's on all mm-hmm. major streaming services, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Tidal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tidal, dude. <laughs> um, you got cas- cassettes, too. Yeah, we've got some cassettes. Uh, we're doing another run of cassettes, a second edition. Um, and then I think we're also going to be trying to do some CDs for you know Ooh. the folks that don't have players in their cars. Because um, I'd like a CD, of, of course. Um yeah, we're going to finish up this tour. We're going to start writing. Um, we've got a couple different dates uh, coming up here in town. We're going to be playing um, Saturday, December 8th at the replay. Um, I'm not sure who with, but uh, it'll be it'll be pretty tight. Um, we're going to try to get some cool bands on that bill. Um, aside from that, we're going to kind of just lay low. Uh, you know, check it out online and... Um, Give us a follow, follow us on Instagram, uh, and then um, hopefully in the next month or so, you'll hear a new announcement from us, because um, by at least mid-January, we're going we're gonna to try to do something again pretty soon. Cool. Cool. Yeah, and people can follow at Shuttlecock Mag on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Visit the website, shuttlecockmusic.com, for all the articles and the photo galleries. Um, and make sure you subscribe to the Shuttlecock Podcast on iTunes and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, you can get our T-shirts, photo zines, and buttons at shuttlecockmag.bigcartel.com. And uh, look out for some punk shows we've got booked coming up. I haven't announced any yet, but there should be some coming up soon. Cool. But, no, yeah, I appreciate you yeah. being on the show today. Thanks for having me, of course. <laughs>